everyone, and welcome to episode 184 of the MTG Goldfish Podcast. It's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we got the full crew here again this week, starting with Richard, the owner of MTG Goldfish. How's it going today, Richard? It's going well. What's up, Seth? Oh, man, recovering from a long but super fun weekend of magic with Pro Tour 25th Anniversary, which is going to be our big topic for today. But first, we have another member of the crew, Chris Van Meter. How's it going today, Chris? It's doing very, very well. Thank you for asking. I, too, am recovering from the Pro Tour and ready to dive in with the spectacle that it was. So, uh, as you probably have guessed, our main topic for this week is going to be Pro Tour 25th Anniversary. Uh, Everything related to it, some individual card stuff, some deck stuff, because it was a team Pro Tour, we actually have Standard and Modern and Legacy to talk about, the Silver Showdown. So just everything Pro Tour related, and then we will wrap up, of course, with Fish Mail at the end of the podcast. So before we jump into it, a super quick shout out to the sponsor of of today's podcast, which is SpikesAcademy.com, which is the world's first e-learning academy for Magic the Gathering, comes to us from a lot of pro players, including Hall of Famer Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa. So you can get 10% off over at SpikesAcademy.com if you use the coupon code GOLDFISH, and you can also check them out over on Twitter if you want to learn more uh, at Spikes underscore Academy. So thank you to them for the support, and with that, let's jump right into it. First off, just general impressions. This was a unique Pro Tour, 25th anniversary Pro Tour, teams for the first time in years and years, decades maybe. So uh, Richard and Chris, what was just like your overall reaction to Pro Tour 25th anniversary? Probably one of the best viewing experiences I've had. Um, it was super long Pro Tour because we had we had the normal Pro Tour, which is like a million rounds, and then afterwards they have Silver Showcase giving you, you know, another hour. So every day was, I think, close to like 11 hours of magic. And for the first time ever, I think, I was like glued to my seat for those entire 11 hours every day. And uh, I was just exhausted at the end of this weekend as like Grand Prix Vegas or something. It was just so much magic. And the matches were incredible. I think we, we've never had so many matches where... I'm typing to Seth, this match is over, and then two seconds later it's like, oh, it's over for the other guy, and then two seconds later it swings back the other way, uh, and apparently that's what Legacy does for you. Palace Jailer is a crazy card, and we got some really interesting matches. Uh, even watching KCI combo off was interesting as uh, Ben Stark tries to uh, you know, stay afloat behind Psy and stuff. Just all the matches were incredible this weekend, so I thought... From a viewing experience, this was like one of the best Pro Tours we've had in a really long time. Yeah, I, I echo the same sentiments. Like, the way they staggered the matches when they were in a feature match, you just got to watch so much magic. Uh, a lot of times what will happen, especially with me, um, is that I don't get to just like sit there for hours and hours and watch. Just whenever I have some free time, I'll pull it up. Um, or just have it running on my computer and like plop down and watch it whenever I have you know, 10, 15 minutes that I can take a break from whatever I'm doing on the weekend. And this time, every time I stopped to check out coverage, there was magic to watch, which is awesome because normally every time I stop to check out coverage, it's, you know, Rich Hagon is on there talking or, you know, Chion is doing some interviews or something, which is cool and that content is engaging, but I really just want to just see more magic. And so I really felt like this particular Pro Tour and this format delivered on that. Plus, like getting to watch these caliber of players play Legacy was so awesome. Like, I'm so happy that this uh, Blue Black Death Shadow deck has taken off because it was such a treat to watch players like Josh Hutter Layton navigate those games with this deck. The margins are, v- are very thin, uh, but when you're a Hall of Famer like Josh, you're just going to be able to find ways to win. And that was just a big treat for the weekend. Yeah, uh, I agree with both of you. It was one of my favorite Pro Tours that we had in a long time. There was so much magic throughout the weekend. I'm one of the people that, and we'll probably talk about this more as we go along, but I tend to like kind of gloss over the limited rounds, maybe watch the draft, and then kind of like sort of watch the actual limited gameplay and then really focus in on Constructed. Uh, But because of the team format, there was no limited, so it was Constructed through the whole weekend. The first day was a little clunky with how the feature match was set up with us uh, them running out of matches a little early and there were big gaps between rounds but then they fixed that for day two where it was pretty much just wall-to-wall magic with them holding some matches or even moving in some backup feature matches 
the gameplay was just, there were so many crazy games, and that might be partly because we were watching Legacy, and I think that was one of the big takeaways, is the community seemed to really embrace Legacy, and it wasn't like Legacy players. These were just, like, random people on social media that I don't think ever even really play Legacy and probably don't even watch it very much because it's not on camera anymore. Uh, Since SCG kind of moved away from it, we get, like, one Legacy GP a year and then Eternal Weekend, but it was very much, I think, beloved by the community because it just made for very interesting close gameplay. So I think all around, like, the Pro Tour itself, was it was just really, really good. So uh, kind of the big hallmark of this Pro Tour was the team thing. So comparing this to a normal individual Pro Tour, uh, what do you think about the format? Is this something that should be done more? Should we revisit it? Uh, How often should we do it? Or do we just say, oh, this was a cool one-time 25th anniversary celebration, back to normal, starting next Pro Tour? I think we should keep it going forward. I think the reason it was so enjoyable was just diversity. Uh, If you just took our standard metagame and played it throughout the entire weekend, I'm sure we'd all be complaining about Chain Whirlers and Turbo Fog and whatnot. Uh, Or if we just played Modern, there'd be endless debates about how fair Bridge is and his face of looting should be banned or Ancient Stirrings KCI. But what happened was we just got a little slice of each format and... You know, when you got tired of Turbo Fog or something, it it swapped over to Death and Taxes. When you got tired of seeing people getting wastelanded, it swapped back to Modern and you saw humans or whatever. So we just got a little bit of each part of Magic and it just made the viewing very diverse. So you didn't get bored because, you know, seeing one, say, um, red-black aggro mirror is fine. Seeing like four of them in a row is probably boring. So the ability to just swap around and fix that through their coverage uh, is really good. And they don't need to artificially fix the metagame to do that because you have three metagames to work with and you have so many teams and matchups to work with. So you can cycle in the content you feel is uh, the best. So I think the team format was critical to making this Pro Tour so viewable and enjoyable. Uh, I agree, but my big hot take on it are is, is a little twofold. So uh, I think that it should only be once one of the Pro Tours out of the year should be team. Uh, it's one of those things that we're finding out pretty quickly from the SCG Tour is that like it can get played out, it can get boring, and like if if you're there's a lot of production value that goes into it and if you get lazy with it it can become a pretty poor viewing experience as we've seen from a lot of the complaints from what's happening on the SCG tour a lot of downtime for when matches stop for when matches end you know quicker than what you would expect and it's a lot harder to move whole new teams into the future match area as opposed to just like moving around a match or two to get on camera so it is something that you have to like be ready and vigilant for and by doing multiple pro tours out of the year there's a chance that they kind of get slapped off um i really like that it kind of plays into like this team series thing that they have going on where you have like these teams of six people but you have to construct like a three-person team and kind of fill in the holes either by putting specialists where they should be or kind of like splitting it up so that you can get get points to people who need points to try to get people to worlds I think that is a pretty cool aspect of it but also just like Richard said the, the variety was great like being able to see different formats being able to um, you know not get bogged down by just watching Chain Whirler over and over like standard in particular can be pretty monotonous but it's still very important because there's a very large you know, group of people that only play FNM and only play standard. So being able to cater cater to them and keep their attention is important for viewership. But also by showing off modern and these cool legacy decks, like you might also just be creating more customers out of those people. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, I'm just going to agree with both of you. I think that being able to have three feature matches and to pick the most interesting one is, that's a huge boon for coverage, because uh, we'll talk about this when we talk about the formats, but the standard meta was not particularly interesting, and if this was a standard Pro Tour, it would have been pretty miserable to watch all the time, but being able to watch some Legacy, watch some Modern, jump over, see a game or two of standard, even if it was Red Black versus Mono Green or whatever, that kept it really interesting 
interesting throughout the whole thing. I think for me, uh, I would like to see maybe like two pro tours a year be standard, like maybe the fall pro tour after rotation and then spring, do modern in the winter. And then summer seems like the perfect time for this team pro tour because I don't think anyone really wants to watch Corset Limited anyway. Like, we can debate Limited and its value to the Pro Tour in general, but uh, Corset Limited is even less interesting than typical Limited as far as a viewing experience, just because Corsets are made for new players and all that stuff. So I feel like that's the perfect window, and it kind of sets it up with these cool team narratives. I know if it was an individual Pro Tour, it would have been much less interesting with the storyline of Team Channel Channel Fireball trying to make it into the team championship, when if the team, they, they basically had two team Channel Fireball teams. One of them did poorly and kind of recovered. The other one did really well and made it into the top four. And if they had won the event, they wouldn't just get themselves into the team championship. They would have also qualified the other half of the uh, team Channel Fireball team. And I don't think that would have worked if it was an individual pro tour. The storyline would have been a lot more cluttered and not as easy to follow. So I think having it be the pro tour leading into the team series championship makes a lot of sense as well. So I hope that we keep doing it, but I would get sick of it if we did it every single Pro Tour. I think that would just be overload and be a bit too much. Yeah, I was going to say just once per year, once per season seems like perfect, especially like you said for this one leading into the Team the team Series Championship. Like It was really awesome in this top four to see players from Team Ultra, or from, from Ultimate Guard like, you know, rooting for Hot Sauce um, because A, they're awesome guys and, you know, you want to see people that you're friends with do well, but also, like, the the Channel Fireball team that had had some poten- had some potential to try and sneak in there, I feel like would have a way better chance of doing well against the Ultimate Guard team than the Hot Sauce team. So there was this little bit of rivalry from, you know, all these Hall of Fame, all of Hall of Fame players being vocal and, like, talking up other teams on social media, which I don't think would have happened had it not been a team pro tour and just like continuing to build on that community and making those hall of fame big profile players just a little more visible on social media i think is a very good thing for the game so moving on from kind of the generalities of the pro tour and the format let's delve into the individual format starting off with some standards since it is uh, the most uh important probably at least to wizards of the constructed format so uh what were your impressions of standard at pro tour 25th anniversary richard and chris so if we had a standard only pro tour oh boy would reddit be having a field day 40 percent Red black aggro, uh, compounded by the fact that when Wizards showed the slide, they couldn't do the math right, so people were like, "Are they trying to hide the numbers?" But it was predominantly uh, red black aggro, and then Steel Leaf Champion. So nothing too new there. But we had two cool decks. Uh, we've been alluding to it on the podcast. People, there have been whispers on social media, but Turbo Fog came out to play with Nexus of Fate, which uh, has its own drama and then also reservoir combo uh a mono blue deck trying to get off uh the combo with aetherflux reservoir and we saw it actually stabilize and gain like 20 30 life uh against uh, the red black deck on camera so those are our two new decks but predominantly chain roller and steel leaf stompy still and then we had just the crazy crazy turbo fog deck it plays nexus of fate uh, and it just takes extra turns while using fogs, and uh, its win condition is to fairy and Karn. So you just basically take a whole bunch of extra turns, and those two cards just keep letting you draw cards. Nexus of Fate tucks itself back into your deck, so you can keep drawing more of them. And as the game progresses, your likelihood of going back into it increases. And uh, people are a bit antsy. Uh, this buy a box promo. Uh, is skyrocketing in price and people are like is Turbo Fog a real deck or not? My personal opinion I think the Pro Tour is a bit skewed when you have 40% um, red black aggro and you have like 20% steely stompy yes the deck that beats up on mid range decks is going to do very well and that would be Turbo Fog uh, and you know the, the, the deck that the mid range decks were holding down was Control which won the overall event by the way uh, control would be the natural predator to Turbo Fog. So I think there's a lot of 
refiguration that's going to happen. This was a very skewed metagame, and this deck just looks insanely good because the deck that it's good against was just a large, large portion of the field. Well, so, like, I, I do agree that it was a bit skewed, but I don't think it was just this event. Like, we've t- week in and week out on the cast, we talk about how all of these this stuff is happening in standard, but the player that's been missing has been Teferi. So, like, these red-black decks, the mono-green decks, they have been keeping these control decks in check, and this Turbo Fog deck seems, like, absolutely insane against red-black or against these you know, mono-green decks. Um, so I'm not surprised to see it do so well here. Likewise, I'm also not surprised to see somebody that's just a dedicated control player like Greg Orange just, like, clean up shop with his blue-white control deck. So I do think that what's going to end up happening is some type of metagame shift where there's like always going to be tilting in one direction or the other and whoever happens to be in the right spot at the right time is going to be favored in an event. The one thing I really like is we see with these Turbo Fog decks, a lot of them play, play just play like a bunch of negates and Jace's defeats in the sideboard but I really liked uh, Yan Wing Chung had four Carnage Tyrant in his sideboard and it just like was crushing all of these control decks um, post board and I think that that's a really good place to be Uh, like as long as you can switch your matchup to be favorable for games two and three you can turn what's an unwinnable game one into an actual favorable matchup for you so I think that that's something that I would be looking at doing moving forward with the deck but it is sweet like the play patterns seem seem very fun there's this you know a little bit of luck that goes into it, so it always feels cool when you just happen to hit an Excess of Fate to keep going when you need to. Um, but I am just really concerned about the price. Like, it, it it can only just keep going up, right? Like, the the rarity has to be close to what a Masterpiece rare is, and, like, there are still $300 Masterpieces out there. It's so like, what's going to happen with Nexus of Fate as this format keeps evolving? And then the rotation happens, and it still sticks around, and Teferi still sticks around. Like... Where do we go from there? Yeah, I think uh, I think that it is true that the Pro Tour metagame definitely was good for the the Turbo Fog deck. I think it was Dave Williams, one of the people that played it, said on social media that their team figured that everyone else had also figured out the Turbo Fog deck, but then everyone else instead <laughs> decided to play decks that just like auto lose to Turbo Fog. So he had a pretty <laughs> good weekend because for some reason everyone stuck with their chain whirlers and just I don't know how mono red. It's got to be I don't even know like you got to beat mono red and mono green like 80% of the time or something absurd with that deck. It's just like not even close to being uh, a reasonable matchup for any of the aggro decks. But I do feel like that's like fairly representative of standard. Like mono red and mono green have been the two best decks. We don't have like super solid metagame numbers, but we have, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if 30 plus percent of the meta was red black aggro and 15% of the meta was mono green aggro in just like standard in general. So I I feel like the format is soft to this type of strategy and it might be that uh, that is the control deck like we've been talking about Teferi and where it fits in the format and maybe the answer to building a control deck that beats these kind of aggro-y mid-range decks is to play like the turbo fog strategy and it's not going away like the key pieces of that deck are search for his Kanta, Teferi, and Nexus of Fate like we always have fogs we always have random counter spells the whole foundation of that deck is going to survive rotation so I too am a little bit concerned over like the long term prospects of this because they're I've had a couple people tell me oh my store still has a few left it must be a store that didn't sell a lot of boxes or something but I think in general these are probably gone on at most of the most of the stores out there so the supply just isn't increasing and we have another whole year of standard to go and it's already up to $40 ish which makes it the most expensive card I think in the standard format as crazy as that sounds so I think that there's definitely some concern there. Uh, on the Nexus of Fate topic, do you think that they will do anything about this? Like, where does Wizards go from here? You have this $40, $50 right now buy a box promo that isn't rotating, is a staple of a deck that is it, it's at least going to be a tier two playable deck. Maybe it doesn't end up being the best deck in standard, but it is very likely going to be a real deck. Are you expecting Wizards to take any action here? Like, we saw, like, to set the context for this, 
Uh, Nexus of Fate shot up to seventy to ninety dollars on Magic Online earlier in the week, and then on Wednesday, which is when the Pro Tour deck lists were submitted for the event, Wizards suddenly out of nowhere Wednesday night was like, "Oh, we're gonna make these super common in the treasure chest, set them to like just unbelievably high distribution rate to bring the price down." So, do you think that there's any chance we see something happen in standard uh, in paper as far as Nexus of Fate? I doubt it. I I don't know that they could do this with any speed. Like, if they wanted to jam it into, say, the next expansion, it's probably too late. Are they going to make a supplemental product? Like, do we have any available to just jam this into? And it's not even clear to me they want to do anything about this. Like, isn't this what they want? They want you to go buy boxes. They want you to say, oh, hey, Guilds of Ravnica's come out. I better pre-order a box because the next, you know, Nexus of Fate might be there. And if you were one of those people that bought a box and got Nexus of Fate and you kept it, your box is basically half price to free at this point. It's like a tremendous win for you, right? So, you know, it's not it's not clear to me that Wizards views this as like the end of the world. Like they they push the power level of these cards with the intent of them selling boxes and here we are, they're selling boxes. However, you know, we could be in the darkest timeline where it does the exact opposite of everything. Because Nexus of Fate is so rare, because it's so expensive, I'm just going to launch Magic Arena, convert four Mythic Wild Cards, and play online instead of going to FNM. Right? So that that's the downside, right? They, they could just actually hose LGSs like this. So there's a very, very fine line they, they need to walk, and I don't know what they could the, the best thing they could do is probably just print up more of the Buy Box promo packs and give them out but like why you know stores could just take them and sell them and like I, I don't know it's it's a really weird way to distribute them the the only real way is like an FNM promo or something but the time frame for that it seems to be like very far and I don't know how long they have to, to deal with this so we could see it ticking up even more if this deck takes off and it's one of those cool things that people like to do people like taking extra turns People like dirtling around and shutting down their opponent. So it's one of those dangerous cards that people will naturally gravitate towards, even if it's not insanely good as well. So, like, I could see them putting it in, like, a standard showdown type pack where, like, they're, all of them are guaranteed to have it or whatever to put more in. But, like, m my big problem is that, like, they said that they wanted these cards to be casual or commander playable but be pushed to not be standard playable at all. And that's, like, as far from what actually happened with this card. Like, when we when it was spoiled and we first chatted about it here on the cast, I, I was very clear in saying that, like, this is the type of... This is the exact type of card that I was hoping that they would never print as a promo. Because if it does catch on, A, it's going to be a four of... And B, it's going to be very, very, very good. So, like, yes, for that person that did buy a box and got one, sure, they might be happy that their box is half off because they got this $50 card. But now they only have one, and if they want to play with it in standard, like, you can't just, like, you're not just going to play one, so now you have to spend $150 to get three more to finish your playset. So, it like, it's very much a double-edged sword, and I feel like it's just a, a big fail from Wizards. Like, this was... This was what is happening is exactly what you said you were going to try to not happen when you started this promotion, and they failed on that front. And they failed in in exactly one set. Like this is what a, a lot of people said, and I said, and other people said when they did Fire Song and Sunspeaker was like, sure, maybe this promo itself is fine, but this is a, you're walking on a very dangerous edge here, where you go a little bit too far one time, and we're going to have problems, and even discounting Nexus of Fate itself, which, like I said, right now is a little bit over $40 a copy, which is already insane, but the deck, uh, the Turbofog deck is pushing $600, and this is with a lot of rotating cheap lands in it that are a couple dollars a piece right now, or even a dollar a piece, like Irrigated Farmland. If we, if this shell and that's not even including all the fogs which are essentially free like you have a handful of ridiculously expensive cards and then a ton of commons which are basically just free to add to the deck but there's a legitimate shot if nexus of fate keeps increasing and then all of a sudden the mana base let's say they do reprint shock lands and you're playing a bunch of lands that are ten dollars a piece instead of a dollar or two a piece 
we could be talking Jace Friends Prodigy standard prices like that. And do you remember what an outrage that was and what a bad deal that was for Wizards just with standard prices being that high? So I think that that's the thing that's probably scary to Wizards most of all is if we end up having like $600, $700, $800 standard decks, people are going to complain about that. Even if some people are willing to be like, all right, I'm going to write off Nexus of Fate, whatever. It just looks really bad in an absolute sense to have deck prices be so absurdly high. Yeah, and I just want to point out how absurdly broken this card is. Uh, there, there are so many factors that lead it to, you know, to it being too good. It's an instant that costs seven, which means it combos with Teferi extremely well because Teferi can untap two lands, making this thing effectively cost five. It shuffles back into your library instead of exiling, which means it comes straight back in, allowing you to go infinite. And I, we saw on camera, uh, Yam basically hit like three Nexus of Fate in a row <laughs> with a Carnage Tyrant and Anissa, and basically just went to town because these things kept shuffling back in and he could scry them back up to the top and with your extra Planeswalkers you just draw them again. Like, this, this card was just insane, like, they must have tried to push it, right? Like, I, I can't see, they took off all of the normal safety valves. So I, I don't believe their argument of them saying, oh, you know, we tried to make it casual and we missed, right? There were so many safety valves that they take off. Instant speed versus sorcery, exile versus shuffling in. Like, I just I just don't believe that argument. Yeah, like, so I would love to see the M files for this card because, like, it had <laughs> to have gone through design and development. But, like, when, when go, look, reading that last M files article and seeing everything that went through for apex of power like that whatever the the red mythic is that like reveals a bunch of cards and you get mana if you play it it's just a, completely unplayable like why couldn't that have just been the buy a box promo and nexus of fate could have just been in m19 is one of the the story points like i, I, I i'm just confused as to why what well, how it happened like did, did, did this was this turbo fog deck just missed by the future future league like, could there have been, like, other deck? Like, was the Teferi deck just so good that, like, the these Turbofog decks didn't do well when they were testing? Like, it, it feels similar to, like, you know, I wonder how many cards got killed in design and development, um, uh, you know, because of a tune with Aether and Longtusk Cub, uh, you know, when they were developing those cards. Like, it just, it feels to me like either the Future Future League was off, when they were developing this card, or they just didn't try it because oh, it's a seven mana, you know, a seven mana spell like that's just not playable. Like whatever, nobody's gonna play it. Yeah, I, that would actually be my guess is maybe that they don't test the buy a box promos to the same level as they test other cards. Maybe maybe they bought into their own idea that oh we're not going to print these as playable cards we make planeswalker deck planeswalkers all the time and those aren't a problem and i'm sure they probably don't spend too much time testing planeswalker deck angraph because you just like know on its <laughs> face it's not a playable card so maybe they just like kind of bought into the idea that oh these are not going to be playable so why bother testing them although someone brought i think it was cube april that brought up on twitter it's not a complicated deck like it's not like oh my god someone found this crazy synergy that no one thought of you'd you kind of play, like, ramp spells, and you play Teferi and Search for Iskana, which are two of the best cards in Standard, and you just, like, go infinite. So it's not, like, some masterpiece of brewing from a pro team. It's a pretty, like, obvious deck if no one actually tried it. Yeah, it, the deck certainly builds itself. You just have to be willing to try it, which, I mean, seeing, seeing what's happening now, I feel like maybe they just weren't. Yeah. Yeah. So before we move on from Standard, let's talk about what didn't show up. Nicol Bolas, my boy Sarkin, zombies, Liliana untouched by death, none of it. <laughs> none, of, none of our cool new decks made it. Uh, is, this, is this typical? Because core sets usually don't impact standard too much. What does this mean for M19? We also didn't have limited. Is this going to be the worst selling set ever? Or is standard still going to adjust? So I, th I think that all of those cards are victim of the team format. Uh, Modern and Legacy have so many more variables to it that I don't think that it is worth playing uh, a deck that is similar to Red Black but not Red Black and possibly give up percentage points to variants and standard when you don't have to. Like I have to imagine that 
a handful of the red black players maybe had you know like the the Grixis red or Grixis mid range or a Grixis control deck with Nicol Bolas that that they could have played, but it just made more sense to play red black and remove remove as much variance as you can from your standard seat so that you have you know kind of uh, insulation for the modern and legacy seat. Yeah, I'm not especially worried about it. I think that it's also true that. Uh, M19 is a core set, and it's the last set in standard, so I think that a lot of those cards you mentioned, Sarkin, Nicole Bolas, uh, some of the other M19 things, maybe not zombies, but I think we'll see those after rotation. I think there's still, it's still very likely that Nicole Bolas is going to be a major player in standard at some point, and Sarkin, along with Nicole Bolas and other dragons, might be as well, so I think that those cards will probably have their time to shine in a couple of months once we get a smaller standard format. We lose the red-black aggro deck it loses essentially like every single card in that deck so i think those cards will get their turn still yeah the, the raid on boss is just too good for him to not be a player once rotation happens and i gotta say i think it, it's a good thing the zombies did not show up because like unless you have lost legacy in your sideboard how do you expect to beat this <laughs> fog deck with like a bunch of you know five mana make two three three like enchantments like there's no way that deck beats the fog deck no nope 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 well, uh, why we still got some time, we've been going along with Nexus of Fate and Standard. Uh, let's jump into Modern and Legacy real quick. So uh, impressions from our eternal or semi-eternal formats at Pro Tour 25th Anniversary. So Modern, I, the, the biggest innovation or the big deck we saw was Vengevine making a comeback. Stitcher Supplier, that's the one man a zombie that mills three when it enters the battlefield or dies apparently uh, gave life to, uh, gave new legs to Vengevine, and we saw some pretty broken things. We saw people dumping, um, you know, six power zombies on turn one and, and just starting to go to town. It looked like a pretty cool deck. I don't know how good it is. I don't know how it fared. It's, it's kind of like a hollow one deck. Uh, the one thing they did note on coverage was turn two rest in peace could be too slow. It's only using its graveyard for one turn and it's kind of go off. And once it has its creatures in play, your rest in peace doesn't do much. So it was an actually pretty interesting deck. And uh, the big talk I think will be KCI. KCI is in the finals again uh, in the hands of Ben Stark. And we just saw it do a lot of nothing. <laughs> you know, you, you watch Ben Stark play for five minutes and you don't know if he's winning or losing. And then he finally fizzles out and you like sigh or he finally wins and you're like, wow, what a comeback. And it's, it's kind of boring to watch, which... And, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's enough of an argument. It didn't take too long. It wasn't as bad as, like, eggs, but it, it was a little boring. I mean, I think five minutes is probably underselling it a little bit. There were definitely some times <laughs> where I think Ben maybe spent five minutes thinking about which artifact to sack. <laughs> so so it, it might not be eggs bad, but it definitely led to some, like, watching Ben combo for 20 minutes, only knowing he's, like, on a five percenter and he has to go, like, runner, 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 but he just keeps hitting redraws and then eventually fizzling out so uh, i don't know i personally i would not mind seeing it banned just because it's i think it's very obnoxious to watch and also to play against i don't think it's necessarily too good and i think you can argue that the pro tour might have shown that it wasn't too good it seemed like people came prepared for it and apparently heading into the finals uh, according to i think it was efro on twitter ben had lost nine matches in a row he could have been the first player to to lose <laughs> nine straight matches and win a pro tour if his teammates had uh had pulled it out for him. So what did you think, Chris? Yeah, so I think that KCI is, um, it should just be gone. Like, like it's, it's, I don't know, it, it's not a good viewing experience uh, for most players, I will say. Like, for me personally, like, I will sit and watch Ben Stark play KCI all day because he's a Hall of Famer, one of the best Magic players ever, and that type of deck is something that I, that I enjoy playing. Um but it's not a good viewing experience for the average player. Um, like it, the inexperienced players that play it make games go really long, and I feel like it falls in that same category of eggs, where it's like, it's not, it's not so degenerate that it's unbeatable, but it's like good enough to win faster than what they want modern decks to be doing, on top of time issues, on top of bad viewing experience. So I will, I would not be surprised to see it go. Um, 
and, and another interesting point from the Pro Tour is all the human decks had Militia Bugler in it. it seems like that's what a lot of people are moving towards. Um, but there are some players that are vocal on social media, like Cedric Phillips, that has been playing a lot of humans that thinks it's garbage. So it'll be exciting to see where that kind of goes in the future. Um, as far as Legacy goes, the Blueback Death Shadow deck uh, is really, really sweet. It seems like it's like the new best Delver deck that you can play in the format. But there were also just a lot of Death and Taxes, two of which, in fact, in the top four, uh, which seems to be you know a natural predator for this deck, according to the players that played it. But one interesting point for me is I felt like Sneak and Show had the potential to be very good going into this Pro Tour, but in fact it had like the worst conversion rate of any of the the legacy decks for top 32 there were like 16 people or there's or some like 11 or 12 people playing sneak and show uh, and only one of those teams made top 32 which is like a pretty low conversion rate compared to, to the rest of the legacy decks so i'm interested to see like where things go from here but it seems like death shadow is uh making its making its way into older formats and not just modern yeah, Legacy was definitely a highlight of the weekend for me just watching it. It's just such an entertaining uh, format to watch. And I was kind of surprised, and you might be uh, better at weighing in on this than me, Chris, but did it seem like there was less combo than you would expect? Like, we didn't really see Storm. We You said that Sneak and Show did poorly. It felt like all weekend when we were watching Legacy, we were watching relatively fair decks, like Death Shadow, Death and Taxes, a lot of Eldrazi Stompy decks, decks that are kind of like kind of like modern decks to some extent where you're playing creatures and attacking and playing normal magic was that a surprise at all to you well so like those types of decks um are uh, natural predators for the combo decks right so like if you look at death shadow uh thoughtseize days force of will and stubborn denial all in the main deck that is a lot of interaction for these combo decks um death and taxes thalia uh, Flicker with like just a lot of interaction for these combo decks. Um, Eldrazi Stompy, same thing with like Thorns and Chalice of the Void. So like the it becomes kind of like a play draw matchup where it's like who is on the play and who is able to like do their thing first, whether it's make their combo happen or disrupt the opponent. Uh, but it just felt like there were way more people on the disruption plan as opposed to the combo plan, which is which is pretty interesting. Um, but I think that with Deathrite Shaman being gone, the decks kind of have to be... They, you can't just kind of be like a mid-range with some disruption and kind of lean on your Deathrite Shaman as having like random main deck hate against certain decks um, and also a body against other decks, where it's now like you kind of have to dedicate yourself to a strategy, right? So, like, you're either Stifle, Wasteland, Delver, you know, t- Team or Delver, or your Death Shadow with Thought Seas and Stemmer Denial and Dazes, or your Eldrazi Stompy with, like, these Chalices and Thorns, which ends up creating a pretty hostile environment for the combo decks. So, uh, again, I'm not surprised to see that happen, especially here at the Pro Tour, but I would like to see more, like, high-profile legacy events to see what happens with this meta, because we are on the heels of, like, a pretty prolific banning, and I think that given time, it could be interesting to see what happens to the legacy meta. I just don't know if we're going to be able to see it, because there just aren't the events. Yeah, that is definitely one of the challenges with legacy. It'll be interesting to see if, I think, the success of legacy at this Pro Tour maybe leads to an uptick. Uh, it still has the problem with card availability, which is just, it might be too big of a to have it be more supported. I will say, though, if you're interested in getting into Legacy, the Death and Taxes deck, now that they've reprinted essentially all the really expensive lands in that deck, Ports and Wastelands and Caracuses, it's only like 11. The The version that uh, was in the top four is like 1150 bucks, which obviously isn't cheap, but you're kind of in modern deck range, essentially. So uh, I don't know. If you have a, a thriving local Legacy seed... That could be a way to get into it without spending three thousand dollars or four thousand dollars. Well, I'll say this: this Death Shadow deck is three Watery Grave, two Underground Sea. Could easily be four Watery Grave, one Underground Sea. Like, and you just need Force of Wills, which had been reprinted. Like, this Death Shadow deck is basically like if you play Death Shadow in Modern, you almost have the entire deck minus Force of Wills, Wastelands, and you know zero or zero one or two Underground Seas, and you have. The entire deck. That's pretty insane if you're just looking to get into the format. Do you, do you think you could play that deck with zero underground seas? Like, is that is absolutely okay? 
Yeah, I... absolutely. Like, like, like you're going to lose some percentages to burn, uh, and you would probably have to play like a basic land so that you can like actually fetch and not have to shock yourself, or maybe even two basic lands. So I could see like three grave, one swamp, one island, or whatever. But, like, you could play this deck without underground seas and like still have it be competitive, which is pretty insane. Because I mean, really, the underground sea is six two copies is sixteen hundred dollars out of the twenty eight hundred dollar price tag. So if you didn't have to Jeez. play those, <laughs> you you have another eleven hundred dollar deck. Sorry, Richard, go ahead. I would say that applies to almost every legacy deck. Like even the the decks that just play all dual lands. If you play shock lands, I'm guessing you lose like a couple percentage points and that's it. It's not as big of a deal as people make it out to be. It's not like you're playing Lava Axe instead of Lightning Bolt, right? It just means you start at two less life. And yeah, some games that actually matters, but a lot of the games it doesn't matter. The game is already over uh, with you with more than that much life. So um, play, playing playing Shocklands is fine, right? And especially if you have just one dual land, that's really good. Like, you don't need the full set of four. Just one dual land that you fetch up immediately uh, gives you a lot of mileage. But I want to say, I haven't played Legacy in three years, and I haven't watched Legacy. You know, we're long past the glory days of turning on SCG on a Sunday and watching people brainstorm. And I want to echo what Seth said. It, it is so insanely fair looking now. <laughs> Uh, you know, we don't see those random combo decks. You don't even see, like, dredge, creature-based combo, like elves. It's pretty homogenous, and uh, it looks like a fair player's dream, which is, I think, why uh, it got such good, I guess, um, comments for Legacy, because a lot of people are very salty when they see people losing on turn one. But what we saw were grind fests, uh, super swingy matches that went really long, and a lot of interaction... Uh, both on the battlefield and on the stack. So it actually looks very, very fun. Uh, I, I kind of makes me want to play Legacy, but it's just so hard to play Legacy. It's so hard in paper to find some place to play. You're just relegated to Magic Online. Uh, but I, I just want to say Death and Taxes looks like a pretty cool deck, but it's so hard to play. Like, if, if you don't tax correctly, it's the difference between a time walk on your opponent versus your opponent doing whatever they want and you dying. And it's one of those decks that I always watch, and when it's piloted correctly, it looks amazing. And then when I play it, like, nothing gets accomplished. All their stuff comes to the battlefield, and I'm like, I'm sitting here with White Weenie and doing nothing. Uh, but in the hands of a master, it's like a total prison lockdown, and nothing is getting done. So it's always very enjoyable watching Death and Taxes play. And it was hilarious watching the finals, where... Uh, the player uh, on Hot Sauce Games fights through three Dread of Nights and Triple Days. Like, hilarious, right? It's just, like, so funny uh, how swingy Palace Jailer is now and how you can come back from what looks like unwinnable situations. Yep. Uh, all right, so we're we're running a little bit late. Really quickly, before Fish Mail, the other big news from the Pro Tour was the Silver Showcase, which was the old card Rochester graph with the Hearthstone players along with some magic rates that we talked about a little while ago. So uh, just a quick thought from each of you on uh, how that event actually turned out. Now that we actually saw it, what was your thinking about the Silver Showcase? Worst use of marketing budget ever. <laughs> uh, so so to be fair, so Stanislav Sitchka, Hearthstone champion, <laughs> won. So the finals was actually between Amaz and Sifka, which was kind of funny but sad at the same time and you know Paulo tweeted that you know he tried to he tried to keep the money in magic but he failed and it, you know it was like a kind of sad and depressing tweet that you know we've come to this but it, it was entertaining to watch people play with old cards but at the same time uh, I was checking a number the numbers on the viewership like we usually had around 10k people viewing like maybe 15k peak uh, during the silver showcase so you're paying basically $10 per person at the 150000 prize pool. It just did not seem like an effective use. I did not see people flocking in from Hearthstone and learning and picking up magic. It just, it just seemed like it was something for old-time magic players, except they gave half the seats away to like outsiders, which didn't didn't rub me right. I, I think I'm more upset now after the fact than when they initially made the announcement because 
initially like okay it's a marketing thing they're gonna market it they're gonna spend their money to get new players and then we just watched it and it was just the same old stuff and nothing changed and they kind of just invited outside people in so i don't i don't really like it they should have just had an arena tournament and uh you know did that and like actually tried to rope in the hearthstone players with it yeah so i have a, a couple hot takes um X spells are way busted back then <laughs> than anything else. Shocker. Amos just dumpstered on people with Howl from Beyond and Fireball. Like, it wasn't even close. Um, he ultimately did end up leaving, losing to Sitka, but that's neither here nor there. I feel like I, I'm super disappointed that there weren't any, like, really big cracks because now I honestly feel like all of those packs sealed would be worth way more than the cards that are being <laughs> donated to charity. Oh, I feel like... I feel like the prize money should have just went to charity and the players just like got to keep the cards or whatever. I can't imagine that any of them would have said no to a Pro Tour invite and, and this draft if you got to keep the cards that you draft. So I think that that would have been a better use uh, of the money. But there's, there was also a funny tweet um, that I wanted to share from Alexander Hain uh, <laughs> from a couple days ago during this the showcase. He just says, 11,000 viewers for the Silver Showcase. I think if they put $150,000 on a table, set packs of beta around it, and sat down all of the Platinum Pros and streamed their faces as they lit it all on fire, they could have at least hit six figures on your show. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a good point. Like, it just did not do what they wanted to do, and there was just a ton of money sunk into it. Yeah, I think that was a big thing for me, is... Uh, it was, it did not achieve any marketing goals. I was keeping an eye on the viewers throughout the thing. I think it peaked at like 18,000, which for Magic is not horrible, but it's certainly not like, oh my God, we have, I think Amaz probably gets that or Sifka or those Hearthstone streamers. So it, it was like a fine Magic stream, but it definitely wasn't reeling in a ton of Hearthstone viewers. And the more disappointing part for me was uh, by the time they got towards the end of the draft, it was down to 11,000. So it, and I don't have evidence for this, but what it felt like to me is whatever Hearthstone players might have tuned in to see their favorite Hearthstone star uh, didn't really stick around, and they they watched it for five minutes. Were like, oh, this uh, this looks uh, not all that entertaining or interesting to me. I don't even know what's going on, and just went back to watching uh, someone stream Hearthstone. So I feel like it definitely failed as a marketing event. So I don't know. Uh, hopefully, Wizards learns from it. It would have been a great event for Magic players. Uh, old time magic players without all the Hearthstone streamers or they could have done like Richard said an awesome arena promotional stream with these Hearthstone players but walking the middle of the road and trying to do everything just ended up being a disaster on basically all fronts yeah the one thing I will say is they they said the H word on stream many many times they they have actively avoided saying Hearthstone and they were just throwing Hearthstone out left and right on stream. And I was actually very shocked. And Seth made a comment that he basically said Arena has given them the strength to say Hearthstone on stream. Because even like Rich Hagon, you know, like actual, you know, the commentators were saying Hearthstone, which was a, a very shocker because I thought they were going to dance around and say, you know, popular trading card game streamer Amaz. But no, they were just like Hearthstone. He's like Hearthstone champion, rank one whatever they, they just didn't care anymore so that's interesting the, the, the other piece that i have from this showcase is like i love riley knight a lot and i can listen to him like do commentary or whatever because i think he's just like really quirky and i like that he uses memes and puns and jokes all the time but like the whole intro that they did only <laughs> the only so, only so that they could do like a Michael Buffer, let's get ready to Rochester at the end of it, really, really turned me off. I just did not enjoy that at all. Oh, uh, yes. Well, I think that's uh, the Pro Tour. That is the Silver Showcase. So let's wrap things up with some uh, some fish mail while we still got a few minutes left. Richard, take it away. All right. If you have questions, send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. Uh, Fractured Phage, when you guys do Commander Clash, how long does it take you to build a deck and test it before recording? Um, it usually takes me a couple of hours, maybe, to build the deck, but I usually play it for the first time on Commander Clash. It's not like I don't get a chance to grind a bunch of games with it beforehand. Yeah, I, it usually takes me, like, under, 
maybe like 30 minutes to an hour to build a deck and I, I never test it. Sometimes when our themes are really deep or I get really into it, I can spend like three, four hours. Like if I'm doing some weird art tribal or something, those usually take a really long time. But like normal decks, usually like 30, 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, Chris, how about when you when you build a commander deck in general, how long does it take you to build one? Oh god, like 10 years. <laughs> I, I am the worst. Like that building commander decks is my least favorite part of the commander experience. Like it literally took me like a week to build my first deck, which was Athreos, and that's because I kept like going to every single Athreos deck that had ever been uploaded on TG Goldfish <laughs> to look at all the all, all the cards, like asking people on social media cuz like I always just want to like naturally try and build the best version of something, but that's like not the spirit of Commander. So I just like really agonize over building Commander decks. I would much rather just have somebody build a deck and then I and then I play it. Yeah, I, I really try to dodge five color decks with no theme because what ends up happening is I put together my deck. It's like three hundred and twenty-two cards, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> time to make some cuts. You know, I, I prefer Crocodile Tribal, where I'm like, okay, I have 15 cards. That's all I have to work with. <laughs> Time to fill in the rest. I, I like those kind of decks better. Uh, Legendary Hero 7. Seth, have you considered going back to your old Against the Odds decks and trying them again with modifications? Perhaps you could try Flashback the Odds. If you did, what would the first deck you want to try be? Oh, man. Uh, I think that would be cool to do once in a while. Uh, the first deck I'd want to try, I think the one card I feel like never really was uh, done justice was Tainted Remedy. I think that's the only against the odds that we did not win a single a single game with. So I think I would want to retry Tainted Remedy and see if I could at least win a game with it. All right, Maxi Wawa, explain it like I'm five paper tournaments for a casual online player. What are opens, PTQs, Pro Tours, Grand Prix? Who wants to take a stab at this? Uh, I can do that. So uh, opens are uh, SCG Tour opens. They're free for anybody to enter, um, and they award prize points and SCG, or they, they will award prize money and SCG Tour points that uh, are able to qualify you for an invitational. Um, for PPTQs, they are open. Anybody can enter. They're ran by your local game store, and they get you an invite into an RPTQ, a regional pro tour qualifier. RPTQs are invite only, and those can get you into the pro tour. Grand Prix are similar to opens. They're free for anybody to enter, and you can win prize money and pro points uh, and get invites into the pro tour, which is an invite only tournament that can win you a lot of money and uh, a lot of pro points to hit pro levels which also lets you play in more pro tours. So as far as like chains go, PPTQ into an RPTQ into the pro tour, Grand Prix into a pro tour, SCG Open into the SCG Invitational. Yeah, that's a that's a really good breakdown. Just to make it clear, like the SCG thing is separate from the Wizards thing. There's basically right now two major tournament scenes, I guess. One is run by SCG, and the Invitational is kind of their pro tour, and that's what the SCG Opens feed into. And then all the other stuff is the official Wizards events that are now run by Channel Fireball, at least on the GP side of things. All right, next question. Moz, MTG, Seth... What software do you use to record and edit videos? Uh, so for recording, I use OBS, uh, which I think is pretty easy to use. That's the main reason I started using it. There is another one out there. I don't remember the name. And then for editing, I use Lightworks, which is mostly free. It is free, but I think you have to pay to get certain features. Uh, and apparently it's horrible. I don't know anything about video editing, <laughs> but that's what every... Whenever I tell someone that actually knows video editing, I use Lightworks. They make this, like, scrunchy ugh face. Like, they're disgusted. So... <laughs> we, we used it because it was free, and now we're just used to it, and... and, and then uh, that's the, old, it. The, old, the old Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Streakist. We all interpreted the increased power level, in quotes, of C18 to mean more better reprints, which was obviously not the case. How do you think these stack up against the previous pre-cons out of the box in terms of power level? 
I think that they're... I think if you battled them against each other, uh, I think that they are maybe slightly worse, but I think they're close to similar. I think the reprints are worse, but I think some of the new cards are better, so I don't think that the newest version would just straight up get stomped by the old editions necessarily. So I don't have any actual evidence to back this up, but just at first glance, I feel like the, like, the best decks in C18 are on par with the best decks from the earlier versions, but the worst decks in C18 are below the power level of the worst decks of the earlier versions. So I feel like they're, they're very similar, but there's a larger polarity and power level between the decks than there have been in the previous Commander sets. Yeah, I think I agree with Chris there. And also, I think Planeswalkers as Commanders is in general worse. It's really hard to protect your Planeswalkers um, in Commander, doubly so, because people know that's your commander and the whole point of your deck, so they go after your commander uh, quite viciously, and it's hard to defend against three people's worth of attacks. So, given the choice, I would actually always play a non-Planeswalker commander due to, due to how hard it is to actually protect them in a multiplayer game. Uh, Captain Buccaneer. Guys, should we ban car- should banning cards be considered if the cards are not oppressing the metagames. Probably, this is probably in reference to Nexus of Fate. Like, say Nexus of Fate isn't that good. Uh, should we ban it because it's like a $150 card? <laughs> Uh, no, I was gonna. I was thinking of KCI, actually. I think there's an argument that a card like KCI should be banned, even though you can also argue that it's not really oppressing the metagame. It's just obnoxious and not good for coverage. Uh, on the other hand, I think Wizards should just print more Nexus of Fate. I don't like the idea of banning a card because it's too expensive, because uh, outside of the reserve list, which is its own issue, there's ways of fixing the problem of a card being too expensive by printing more of that card. There's also, like... It's way more complicated on when cards get banned, right? So, like, would you say that Rampaging Ferocidon <laughs> was oppressing anything? <sighs> no. All, all, all uh, my Thunder dur- decks, come on. <laughs> during the time when Stoneforge and Jace got banned in Standard, um, they weren't oppressive. There were other strategies that you could play and be successful, even though these ones were the best. The big issue was that the price tag of those cards made the that like tournament numbers just plummeted. People were not playing in F and M because they were tired of playing against the person that had, you know, four hundred dollars for the Jaces and two hundred dollars for the Stoneforges in their deck when they couldn't afford it. Uh, so that is something to consider and plays along with this Nexus of Fate. Like if if Wizards is absolutely no, I'm not going to reprint it, and the price still continues to to go up people will get to a point where they feel like I'm not going to dump the money into these cards and I'm not having fun playing against the people that have them, so I'm not going to play. That could potentially lead to a banning if that's what the situation becomes. Alright, next question. Frank Gardenia. Nexus of Fate seems fun in Standard. Is there any chance it sees play in Modern? Could it improve taking turns or 7 CMC just too high? I think it's unlikely. Uh, We could see people try it, I guess, in taking turns, but there's so many other extra turn spells, and the way that taking turns works, it doesn't really value an instant speed taking turn spell, because once you cast your first sorcery speed one, you're planning on just never letting your opponent take another turn. So I feel like it's uh, fairly unlikely to show up in modern. I think if it does, uh, it's just a new version of the taking turns deck that's the benefit of this particular card is that it shuffles back in and allows you to go infinite and is comboed with cost reduction effects like Barrel or Goblin Electromancer. So I think that if it does spawn or if it does start seeing play in modern, it would just be like a new version of taking turns that's focused on literally taking all of the turns because they have these cost reduction effects and those cards shuffle back in. Yeah, after seeing Teferi and Legacy, Beaumont Courier, Liliana the Last Hope, all in Legacy, I'm gonna rule you never nothing know, out, right? right? <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> someone's gonna find a way to play this in Modern. It, if it's a standard All-Star, I, I think going one format down is not too out of the question, so maybe. Juzams to Plowshare. No one is playing lands at Pro Tour 25th Anniversary. Is it time to sell Tabernacle and or Drop of Honey? I, I think that Lands is a perfect example of uh, a price bubble for a expensive tournament like this. 
like not everybody playing in this Pro Tour plays Legacy, and so it was way easier to acquire like Death and Taxes or Blue Black Shadows cards than it is to get like a twenty five hundred dollar Tabernacle. That then you just have to figure out like what am I going to do with this Tabernacle after this tournament. So like, I think that that Lands was a victim of its own expensiveness for this tournament. All right, Bruno Alzaguire just got my right sh- just got my right shoulder through a surgery, and I'll spend the next month. Uh, with it immobilized, what are your top five videos on the channel? Ooh, jeez, man. Uh, so man, a whole month is he just gonna watch them over and over <laughs> and over again? <laughs> just watch all the videos. On well, the channel. I hope I hope your your surgery went well, and I hope you recover. Uh, favorite videos? I like Thirty Four Rhinos. I think that was one of our first popular videos, so it has some nostalgic kick for me. Uh, what was the phonetic? Remember the phonetic video set? Oh, what against against the odds phonics. Yeah, that one was pretty funny. That was one of the against the odds like one year anniversary celebrations or something. That one's pretty good. I think uh, Tomer recently retweeted the Commander Clash with the infamous uh, <laughs> turn one commandeer your mana crypt and then strip mine your only land. So I think that was season two, episode twenty nine of Commander Clash, which is that was kind of a classic moment. Um... Jeez, maybe like the modern eight whack budget magic deck. That's still a deck that I go back to a lot when people ask me the best budget deck for for modern. All right, that's a good selection of videos that you can check out while you recover. And last question, K Frizzle. I'm sure a lot of people have this. When do we sell our Nexus of Fates? Oh my goodness, uh, I. <sighs> I would probably hold them. You, you never know if Wizards does something crazy like they did on Magic Online, which totally threw the market for a loop. So there's a chance that Wizards is like, oh, we're going to make this a F&M promo or something. Uh, otherwise, I don't think much supply is entering the market, and I really think the card is going to continue to be relevant after rotation. So outside of Wizards doing something crazy, I would, I would probably keep holding it. I think if it ever gets to a point that you can buy listed for $60 or more, you should get out. Yeah, I, I don't know how much higher it can go, because even I, I don't know people that would be comfortable spending so much money, because the deck is already so expensive with Teferis and Karns and whatnot, so I, I just can't imagine it hitting like 100 plus. Like, either Wizards will do something about it, or players just won't stomach it and do other things. Uh, so that's our fish mail for the week. Thank you everyone for sending them in. If you have questions, send them to the hashtag MBGFishmail and we'll get to your questions on air. And I think that brings us to the end of episode 184 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So everyone, thank you for listening. Richard and Chris, thank you for hanging out. And again, thank you to Spikes Academy, the sponsor of tonight uh, today's podcast. So check them out on SpikesAcademy.com. Anyway, we will be back next week to talk some more magic. Until then, have a wonderful week and This is the crew signing out.